was thinking is I didn't even want to use slides. And one of the things that I really wanted to do is I'm sure there are a lot of uh, among you in the audience, maybe some of you are starting companies, some of you are a big company, some of you might be at school and you're thinking, how do I get to that next step? This is Silicon Valley after all, everybody's starting something and success is so revered and yet the path to it is so not easy. Uh, and the path to it also so not common. Especially people uh, that have an unexpected background. And in fact, that was kind of the story that I want to tell you about today because if you actually look at my family story in the background, there should be zero chance I should be in front of you. And my Google job, there should be zero chance I should have been at Google. And I feel the only reason that happened is very much similar to some of the crazy things that happen in the world. Somebody comes up, wakes up, uh, and they have a big dream, and they just don't stop until they pursue that dream. Um, and, and the thing that I wanted to kind of leave you guys with is that I think all my life in critical junctions, um, people try to put me into a bucket. And we do that. You know, as human beings, I think we're just really into patterns and pattern matching. And I think every great thing in my life happened because I refused to fit into that bucket. Uh, in fact, I was just listening. It's like, hey, I speak five languages. It's not like I woke up one day and said, I'm going to learn all those languages. In fact, in high school, I couldn't speak French. And my friends would make fun of me. And I'm like, I'm going to go and learn that language. And then my best friend got into an Ivy League. And I, could, I couldn't. And I said, why is that? Like, I'm just as good as him, and then I ended up getting into grad school at Wharton. Um, at Wharton, uh, the crazy story is the only interview I could get was with Green Giant. And I never forget the story. I literally still, uh, fly to Minneapolis, and I'm like, wow, I'm, I guess I'm going to be a product manager for sales and builders. Um, and then I'm like, I see these like, corridors between buildings. I'm like, what the hell are those things? And they're like, well, it gets really cold here, so we really have to stay inside. Um, and they made me an offer, and I'm like, as soon as I left there, I'm like, whatever it is that I do, I know one thing, and I don't want to be a product manager for sales and hamburgers. So whatever I have to do, I have to do that. And um, the good thing about being uh, at Wharton at the time, uh, we had Silicon Graphics coming to campus for interviews, and they didn't put me on the interview list because I wasn't even an engineer. So I literally camped there at 6 a.m. in the morning, found the guy who was coming to interview the students, and I said, hey, you know what? I really, really love this company. Can you please give me a chance to talk to you so that uh, maybe I can get a summer internship there? So anyway, after I think a couple hours, the guy is like, look, I have to interview this guy, otherwise he's not going to leave me. So I do that. Then I fly to California, and every business leader that I talk to, I resonated with. But then the HR people are like, you know what? You're not an engineer. So like, lucky for you, you were at least able to come here for interviews, but there's no way we're going to hire you. And then literally the next week, every single business manager that I talked to made an offer for me for a summer internship. So um, it's because they just saw like a guy who was really hungry, who was really passionate, and said, I really want to work for you. And here's like something that I can do. Um, anyway, the crazy story about that is Silicon Graphics at the time was a great company. And then talk about timing and luck, right? So I go into Silicon Graphics my first month. Clinton is visiting. Steven Spielberg is visiting. I'm like, I'm a genius. This is an awesome company. And right after that, every single thing starts going wrong. We go after layoff after layoff. Meanwhile, my friends are joining Netscape and Yahoo. And I'll never forget, I go to Mountain View to the movie theaters. And there they are, the people whose companies are going public. And I'm like, god damn it. I'm such a stupid fool. And I just missed the biggest technology wave in the history of Silicon Valley. You know, I'm just at this company that used to be great. Now all my friends are getting laid off. And you know, I have this, this life. And what am I going to do? Little did I know that one of my closest friends from SGI, because of his Michigan background, became employee number nine at Google. And also some of the first business people at Google were actually originally from Silicon Graphics. And uh, at the time, I knew that I had to make a change. And all of a sudden, I started really hitting it off with people at Google. And somehow, I convinced them um, to bring me in. But even that was a crazy story, because at the time, I was on a work permit. Um, it took about three months, and Sergey would email me and like, dude, we can't wait for you. Can you just please marry an American girl so we don't have to deal with this? Like, we're going to just give up your job. Like, hurry up. So I still have nightmares to this day that I actually didn't make it to Google. That was a dream. Uh, it actually didn't happen. Luckily, I think it did happen. Um, and then I get into Google, and they were like, look, we really don't know what to make with you, but at least I spoke five languages, and all the people that were computer PhDs, I'm like, look, this guy speaks five languages. He must be really good. you know. And so I go on and take on the first international project at Google. 
And um, we launched Google in 11 languages in three months, and I'm like, this is pretty good. You know, Larry should be very impressed with that. Next day, I'm talking to Larry, and Larry's like, you know, kind of with grumpy face. Yeah, that wasn't really bad. Like, I really want you to do 100 languages in about like a month or so. Why don't you just go home and start figuring that out? Like, nothing, or oh, great, we're not in 11 languages or anything like that. Um, and then it dawned on me that, you know, the genius of that company was really Larry's head. And I learned a lot of things from him, and I realized that he really was the product manager at Google. Kind of like Steve Jobs at Apple, he was kind of the genius behind it. And there wasn't much that I could add. And so I'm like, I need to switch roles. And, you know, what should I do? And at Google, literally, the only two groups that were respected were engineers and sales. Great. Well, I'm going to get into sales. Well, I have never done sales before. I don't know how to be a salesperson. That's not like in my background. Um, also, it kind of as a negative cliche, you did all these advanced degrees and you're going to be a salesperson, like a used car for you know, sales or something. No, it's not like that. So I'm like, okay, well, I'll go figure this out. Um, and also, not just sales, but sales internationally. So I'm like, well, great, how are we going to do that? And so I made a list of all the major countries for Google, all the big portals, and literally put the list in my office and I said, I am not like, you know, sleeping or whatever until I figure out how to get a hold of each different one. And to this day, like one of my favorite stories, Japan was a big country for us. I never lived in Japan. I don't speak Japanese. I'm like, God, how am I going to break into this country for Google? If I don't, they're going to think I'm a failure. So I literally emailed the customer service. It's the only thing I could find in English. I said, look, with Google, you know, we're providing search. Would you guys please like to talk to us? And I think, oh, this is kind of a loser way of approaching them. They're never going to answer the email. A week later, somebody does answer the email. A month later, I'm meeting a VP at Fujitsu. Uh, they had this uh, big portal there. And two months later, we have our second biggest deal in Japan. In fact, I don't even speak Japanese. And the crazy thing is I show up in Japan. They're like, they send this crazy Turk like, to do deals for Google. And that was the story after that for like 30 countries. I go to Germany. I go to France. I go to Taiwan. I go to China. Um, and I have some crazy stories out of that. But you know, when I think about that, and I think about like how did I just end up there, which was a really formative time of my life. When I was six years old, I used to daydream at school that I wanted to be a Marco Polo. And I'm like, wow, like, I just want to travel around the world. And now I'm like, wow, actually, I did get to do that when I was 30. And the whole point of that is every one of us, since we were children, we had some dreams. Right? There were some things that we were really passionate about. And at some point in our lives, we kind of like get into this path. And we start kind of giving up those dreams. Or we start kind of accepting the bucket people put us in. And so one of the things that I wanted to tell you guys today, that if you don't take anything else from this conversation, um, at least remember this, that don't let your other, other people put you in buckets that you feel like you don't fit in. Right? Create your own bucket. If there is not one, make a new one. Um, and anyway, so I have this pretty incredible ride at Google, and I can talk about it a little bit more. Learned a lot of great things. Probably one of the best things that I learned is that how um, there are people in the world like Larry that I had a great fortune to work for that never um, took anything existing at its face value and always thought very big. And so I left Google um, at the time when it was 3,000 people after having seen it grow by 100 times. And I thought, this is an incredible company, and I had a great ride. But honestly, this was Larry and Sergey's company, and I was just in there for a ride. I mean, I did a lot of things for that. I even installed servers and weekends, and I would have cleaned the floor if necessary. And it's a crazy thing, right? I mean, you look at it, and now the company looks so successful. These people come out of it. They have these grandiose backgrounds. They get listed, you know, blah, 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 this country and that. And yet we were like family. We were in the trenches, and I have tremendous respect for these people. They were some of the smartest people that I've ever met. So I leave Google, and this brings me to the question about entrepreneurship, right? So how do you even become an entrepreneur? Maybe some of you guys have already figured it out. Some of you are thinking about it. Um, so I leave Google, and I realize at one point I'm going to have a family. And I thought, what do I want people to like call the last chapter in my life? The guy got lucky at Google. He took a semi-permanent vacation. Now he just spends time with family. And I'm like, that can't be it. That can't be the last chapter. There's going to be other stuff. And so when I was thinking about what to do next, I realized that, well, I was really fortunate. I made a little bit of money, and it's the way of Silicon Valley. Why don't I go start angel investing, and maybe there is something that could be done about it. But even that, being kind of like the analytical guy that I am, like, maybe I should go intern at a VC. And probably one of the best things that happened to me is that I interviewed like five VCs. All of them actually said, you know what? 
we do see that you were a guru and you seem to be kind of a smart guy, but you weren't really that senior. You haven't really risen up to the management ranks. You don't have any investment experience. We don't really believe you can actually do this. So why don't you like go try it on your own? But we don't really train people like you. And I, actually, that was probably the single best thing that could happen to me because it kind of lit up this fire inside of me that, wow, like these people think that I can't do it. Like I'm a loser. And honestly, I wasn't even sure myself. And I spent about four years. And the thing that I can summarize is that I basically took advantage of the fact that I was doing it on my own. And I took every single rule about venture capital, and I either bent it or I broke it. Because I said, look, there is no way I have much less money than other people. I have much less experience, actually zero experience. So the only way I can do stuff is basically doing things in a different way. And then also find some shortcuts. So one thing that I found is that there were some great people that at Google. I found some of the most famous ones and said, look, you seem to be getting great flow. Can I help you with anything and like just do a lot of work so I can join some of your deals? So I took that being the first ex Google angel and all of that. Um, and I literally translated within four years into a bunch of exits. And then I took that um, and was able to uh, raise some institutional money. Now, um, one of the reasons um, I'm, I'm also telling you about like this kind of next step, uh, once I started kind of doing OK and started getting some exits, I'm like, look, uh, I actually uh, want to go ahead and you know start a franchise and raise money from institutional LPs. And the reason why I'm telling you is, a lot of people think all VCs, you know, they're just kind of there in the ivory tower. They're deciding to write checks or not. Actually, like the nice thing about like what I had to do to really start something from scratch. First of all, there are not a lot of venture capital firms started from scratch, let alone by somebody who doesn't have a background in it. Uh, and I think I got a tremendous appreciation and respect for the entrepreneurs I work with because I have to spend months and months convincing LPs that they should back me, and they ask me all the wrong questions. I had a great strategy, I had results, they were like, look, you're a single, you know, you're just one guy, we don't really know, like, we don't, like, kind of back people like you. And I think I had, like, a hundred notes. And not only that, but I had this, what I thought was a great story, and I think I rewrote it, like, at least 150 times. Every time I had a setback, I went back and, like, what did not work? And I kind of used to remember and thinking, like, what were people reacting like and just kind of make subtle little changes to it. And so, Anyway, uh, fast forward, you know, in four years we raised three institutional funds, the strategy has not changed, but now we're adding people and we just have this great luxury of being able to do things differently. For instance, you know, with our fund, you know, we were always kind of backing founders and standing behind them, but we announced that we're going to vote our shares always with them. And I thought that was really cool because it's something we already did, but something bigger firms like the Sequoias, Benchmarks, Axels of the world would never do. Um, and the same thing I did at Google, I also did when I was a venture capitalist. I said, look, the only way we're going to be uh, successful and have a brand is to go back to the world's best companies. Sometimes they're not even in the US. So I remember thinking, hey, you know, um, how do you find these companies? And so one day, uh, I'm at this like uh, car event. I really like cars. You know, I'm there and I ran into this Danish guy. He's the founder of 37 Signals and he's like, look, you know, I like you, like it's cool to talk about cars with you, but we hate VCs, we never take money from people like you. So that would have been the end of it. I would have given up and said, man, that was a harsh, harsh time. Uh, and instead, I'm like, wow, this guy is really smart. Let me look at his blog. So I look at his blog, and I find this company called Shopify at the time that didn't raise any VC money. Three crazy Germans going to Canada and starting this commerce platform in Canada. So I'm like, well, we need a commerce platform. This looks like a great company. I really want this company. I'll email the guy. Nothing. Six months, five emails, nothing. And then finally, a Canadian friend of mine made an introduction, and he took the email. So I fly to Ottawa. Um, he's like, well, you know, I don't know about you. Like, we'll see. Like, would you fly to Ottawa? And this is January, and it's like negative 40 in Ottawa. Like, great. And I need, like, two stops. There's no direct flights to Ottawa. So I get on a plane. I go to Ottawa. And they're really impressed. First of all, they're like, wow, you actually showed up. And then we really bond, and I see that it's an amazing team. Uh, and they were telling me the story literally that they really wanted to go with Benchmark, but the partner from Benchmark wouldn't get on a plane and go all the way to Ottawa. I think it's going to be one of our biggest companies. We're like really good friends with the guys. They have grown the company 50x since we've gotten involved. But the reason why I'm telling you that, the crazy thing about venture capital, unlike, not unlike many of your jobs or what you're doing, um, 10 years later you made an investment decision. People think you're a genius, but the reality is on the way to that ending, 
Um, every month, you're a genius or you're a complete fool and stupid, and it changes back and forth, back and forth. You're like, oh my God, this was a great decision. Next month, something goes wrong. Like, that was terrible. That was terrible. I totally screwed up. It's totally not going to work. And the crazy thing is, sometimes you see these amazing fathers, and very early on, most people don't want to believe in that. And I think one of the things that I love the most is that, you know, some of my favorite stories is working with fathers when 50 VCs turn them down. And we believe in that. And they start with like two people, three people, four people. Uh, and then all of a sudden they have 400 people. And I look at it, and it is one of the most amazing things. I will tell you that, other than my family, my biggest point of happiness is seeing things happen against all odds. Right? When people put you in a bucket, you're like, no, I do not fit into that bucket. I'm going to create a new bucket. When people tell you it can't be done, you actually do it. And one of my favorite things at Google was we used to get all these European delegations. And they were like, this is the Belgium of, uh, this is the delegation of Belgium, blah, blah, blah. 20 people, every single one is a white man, no women, no colored people. We're just going to come to Silicon Valley and we're just going to listen to you and you know, get all your secrets and start like a tech business in Europe. And to this day, I never forget, like in 2002, Germany and France put, I think, $500 million into some company, said, Google, that's the American giant, we don't accept that. You know, we're going to go create a European search giant. Well, that didn't go anywhere. They wasted $500 million. But um, the point of me telling the story is that it was really funny that one of the things that I enjoyed the most about my job at Google, even as a VC, is that it's so fun to be in front of people where like, they're like, hey, you have an accent. Where are you from? And I just love telling them I'm Turkish because like, I know that there's no way they would think a Turk would make a VC. They also didn't believe like that, that person could represent Google. And maybe some of you in the audience also thinking, you know what, I don't have that background, or I didn't go to this school, or that. And to be honest with you, um, I, I, I hope that this story kind of inspires you, because nothing that happened in my life would have ever like put me in this path and where I am today if I actually didn't take a hold of it and said, you know what, this is what I want to do. This is what inspires me. And in fact, the more I did that, the more I loved what I was doing and didn't feel like work. Uh, and the more I pushed it, the better it got. And so um, I hope that stays with you. Um, the, second, uh, the second thing that I want to tell you is that probably three, four times in my life, the things happened because I surrounded myself with exceptional people. And I remember my best friend when I was in high school, when I was 12, it was through him that I started getting into computer programming, um, or the people that I worked with at Google that were incredible thinkers. Um, one of the things that I also want to leave you with you have an amazing life ahead of you, whatever you're doing, and don't surround yourself with mediocre people. Whatever it is that you do, kind of point out and find the people that inspire you the most, that challenge you the most, uh, that are different thinkers than you are. Um, I think that made a big difference in me. These are people that could be working with you. These are people that you could be hiring. These are people that could become your investors, that could become your advisors, even your friends. I'll never forget, like, you know, I'm 30 and I have so many friends still, but I never just hung out with people just because they spoke the same language or they shared the same background. I always wanted to be around people that challenged me, where I like looked up and said, oh my god, this guy is a woman of a genius. Like, it's so inspiring. I can't even believe I'm in the same room with this person. And it's really interesting because that kind of a, has an effect of kind of self-fulfilling prophecy and really makes a big difference. Um, and then the other thing, I'm telling you all kinds of random things because I just want you to know I consider you guys here all friends, and um, you know there is something that I, I, I remember when Steve Jobs was alive and he did his commencement at Stanford. He said, "Look, you know one of the things that he said that always stayed with me like have faith that that will connect." Like there are times in our lives where, of course, our dreams and aspirations to be this great person, success, start companies, rise through the ranks, have a family, whatever it is. But the reality is, it's not a straight path to that, right? Sometimes we have setbacks. And, you know, I remember, like, I had major setbacks. Um, I remember graduating from college and not being able to find a job. And the only way I could do it is, like, go to the Swiss company where I interned. And they're like, the only job we have for you is to go to Morocco. So I had to drop everything that I had, go to Morocco, where a minute of a telephone call to Turkey cost $10. Had to, like, leave my family, leave my girlfriend, leave everything I know, and go into a country where, like, I thought, oh, great, at least it's Morocco. I'm sure, like, they're like Turks. And just, like, the crazy times in my life were like, it's Constantinople, not Istanbul. I'm like, thank you for telling me that. And like, oh, the Turks, like, in 1500, they came to our country, blah, blah, blah. Um, and I go to Morocco, and they're like, we actually don't like you. You did this, X, that. I'm like, 
I'm, I apologize for like my forebears 500 years ago, like coming there. I'm not that. But um, anyway, like so many times when things just like were just awful, I thought I'm a loser and my friends are doing better than me. And yet, in, in, in those times, I took all that energy and said, you know what? If I'm that serious, if I'm that upset, I'm going to take all of that pent up emotion, and Turks are pretty emotional, like you guys, and then I'm, like, I'm just going to put all that energy into doing the one thing that's going to matter and change the trajectory. So, um, anyway, I hope that uh, that resonates with you. Um, we're just having a really good time doing what we're doing, um, and there are some amazing companies being created. I tell people these days, it's a little bit like Florence in the 15th century. Um, I think fundamental innovation in all areas are getting created. If you have any inspiration of uh, being a founder, if you're already a founder or you want to join a startup, I couldn't think of a better time. Um, and when you're thinking about, well, what is a good idea? And one thing I would tell you is don't settle for incremental things. Uh, the reason why that is really important is the most successful products are really products that make a difference. And in fact, right before I talked, somebody in the audience was asking me, well, you know, like all these people talk about startups, and I don't really know what a great company or idea is. And the way I think about it is, whatever it is, it's one of those things, either a product or service. Um, you don't really think about it because it doesn't exist. But once somebody comes up with it, all of a sudden it's like, you're like, wow, this is amazing. I can't imagine life without it. I can't imagine life without my iPhone. I can't imagine life without Uber. Uh, we have this great co bunch of great companies, Fitbit, like, I don't think my wife could be without her Fitbit. And those are the kind of fundamental products that really change people's lives. It starts as a two, three person company with you know, not much going for it. So I hope you think of that. And when you're working on things, either you know, work for a company that is not thinking of 10% or incremental innovation, but something that is really formative. And you can also tell because those kind of companies tend to have a kind of a mission, a culture, where it's not the job, it's not just the company, it's they really want to change the world in some way. And it really motivates you and doesn't feel like, hey, I'm just going to do this. Um, it moves you. Um, it also allows you to bring other people around you to share that. So, um, so those are some of the things that I wanted to share with you. Um, I can tell you also a little bit about what we're looking these days. Um, the other thing is when I was uh, talking with Shubera, he said, look, can you also talk a little bit about funding? Because there might be a lot of entrepreneurs among you. Maybe you're extremely successful. You're not fundraising. Maybe you are fundraising. Uh, the last thing I want to do here is a pitch, but what I will tell you is that if you ask me for advice of like the kind of things you're looking for and something that maybe can stay with you is that we used to try to look for all these different things and then I realized that really it actually comes down to all these people. Um, the people that we back and have done the best are product visionaries, so they have some crazy insight about what makes a product great. The second thing is even at the earliest days when you know they have these big dreams where success is far from guaranteed, they have actually visualized their success. They say things like, we got to be a billion daily user company, or we got to serve 10,000 companies, or we got to change how people measure their activity. We got to change how people uh, track nutrition. We got to change how people diagnose illnesses, something like that. Something that is really, really formative. And they go beyond that even, and they actually deconstruct their success. They say, well, the way to get there is basically do X, Y, and Z, like, to grow 10% month over month. In five years, I'm going to go to this. Um, I need to have core innovation in these three areas, and then I can start diagnosing people. I need to create a device that is 10 times lighter and 10 times faster than X. Whatever that is, that's kind of how they think about it. Not only have they come up with a dream, but they've actually already visualized a path in their head. Their vision and their dream is not like, I'm going to go out there, talk to 10 stellar VCs, and raise like 5 million. That's not the dream. The dream is actually some amazing product or some service that they're trying to do uh, that really, uh, really, really resonates. And, and that's the thing, you know, there is no such thing as like, you know, investors listening to a story and like, hmm, okay, I'm going to go back, you know, it, 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 there's something about the idea that really captures you, that really kind of, uh, you know, makes you like not be able to think that that, that shouldn't exist and go after it and pursue it and, and help to make it, uh, to make it a reality. So. Um, I'll pause there. Um, I hope some of these things relate with you guys. Uh, and I want to share with you because so many of the people, like when you see them on TV, whatever, oh my God, this person did X, Y, and Z, and look, now they're a celebrity or they're a CEO or something like that. And the reality is it's not like that. And, and anybody uh, that just kind of has great inspirations and works hard and 
have great ideas, I think, can get to where they want. Thank <laughs> you.